Greetings everyone. As always, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Open Source Software Development. Hope everyone's doing well out there in these troubled times. Today I want to talk about open source basics, about what open source is and how it works. And for some of you, this won't be such new material, but I hope that there'll be something, a little something in here for everyone. And for a few of you, it may be that in 2020, you still aren't so familiar with open source. So I feel like it's worth taking some time to talk. about. So what is an open source? Why, what do I mean when I say that? It's actually not that complicated a question. At the heart of it, open source is source that's been made open, that it's freely available for people to work with. But a lot of the time, it tends to get defined in terms not of then a philosophy, but a legal status. This source is open source because it's under an open source license. And it's worth saying some very basic things that we'll talk about later when we talk in detail about legal matters. First of all, under international law, any source code you write, any documents you write, whatever, are automatically copyrighted by you. And so if you want to distribute your work to other people and allow them to use it, you actually have to explicitly grant them some of your rights under copyright. And that's what an open source license is about in a nutshell, is this idea that I include with my work a license that says under what terms you may use it. And for it to be an open source license, those terms are going to be about making it available for you to use freely and share. And so, yeah, the source code has to be out there, available to the public. If you are not willing to have people even be able to look at your source, then you can't really put it under an open source license. That won't have the right effect. The typical open source license also grants a whole bunch of other rights. You could look up Stallman's Four Freedoms of open source if you want to have a good summary of the basic rights that we expect to have in open source licenses, the right to use the, so the software or whatever, the right to make changes to it, the right to distribute it, including distributing your changes to it, the right of other people to then do those same things is very typically what you're going for when you have an open source license on your work. And so not every license that looks open source is. It's become common over the last 20 years for companies to grant very limited rights to source code. They look, they turn out a good example would be uh, Microsoft's rotor implementation of .NET was originally under a license that allowed you to essentially modify and compile the code, but didn't allow you to, or sorry, look at and compile the code, but didn't allow you to modify it, redistribute, et cetera. We don't call those open source licenses. Licenses generally fall into two distinct camps. I'm gonna call both of these camps open source for my purposes from here on out, and I have up to now as well, but the terminology thing here gets complicated. A, License that's sort of open source in capital letters, such as the BSD or MIT license, essentially grants the freedom for the user to do whatever they want, the person who obtains the work to do whatever they want with it, with very broad boundaries. One of the things I should have said anytime I talk about licenses, I'm not an attorney, none of this is legal advice, but the basic idea here is that other than don't remove the copyright notice, don't remove the license no notice, you know, whatever you want to do with it within reason, that's pretty, pretty cool. The other set of licenses that were originated by the Free Software Foundation, Richard Stallman and that group originally had this idea for licenses that went beyond by limiting your right to do whatever you want to 
in ways that encourage sharing. It's a little bit of a legal hack. And so with these licenses, which are sometimes referred to as viral licenses, if you share your work with other people you and that work is under one of these licenses, you must share the source code to that work as well. So if you take a GPL program, the GPL being the most common free software license, and you make changes to it and distribute binaries or whatever containing those changes, then you have to make the corresponding source code available as well. And so it's a, a sort of a trick of using the license to enforce sharing. And there's been a lot of tempest in the teapot about these two camps and what they represent and this and that. And you'll hear terms like free and open source software or free libre and open source software. Both the advocates of capital O, capital S, open source and the advocates of free software sort of agree that philosophically the other camp is also them. And so it's perfectly accurate to call free software open source. It's absolutely accurate to call open source free software, more or less. And so I tend to just call everything open source. Uh, some people would disagree with that, but that's what I tend to do unless I'm trying to be more precise. So if you go to opensource.org, this organization, which was really started by the capital O, capital S open source camp, is the organization that sort of acts as the respected curator by the community of what constitutes an open source license. You can go to that site and look at their sort of terms of what they will certify as an open source license. You can also find, if I remember right, more than a hundred licenses that have been certified by the open source initiative as being officially open source licenses. And that includes the GPL, it includes the BSD license, the MIT license, the Apache license, the, you know, on and on and on, Pearl artistic license. And so there's a wide range of licenses that you can choose from that sort of are officially open source licenses. And I would encourage you to limit yourself to those. The, uh, in fact, for my course that I'm teaching right now, you're required to limit yourself. These are licenses that have received expert scrutiny by lawyers and other open source aficionados and really have been validated to really make sense of what open source means. So there, it was easy. Here in just a few minutes, we figured out this is what open source is. Well, no. Defining something in terms of a licensing agreement is sort of not that great. And I would argue, as somebody who's been doing open source really since it existed, that the license is a necessary part of open source software, but it's not necessarily a sufficient part of open source software. When I say open source, I'm going to mean more than that. I'm going to mean the practice of open source and how it's done. First of all, for me to really think of a project as an open source project, it has to be open to outside developer contribution. So Google, for example, maintains things like the Chrome browser that are fantastic projects and whose source code is freely available and is under an official open source license. And you can go look at it and make changes to it and redistribute the changes. But if you want to share those changes with other people, you can't do it typically by sending those changes back to Google's repository and having them incorporated into Chrome. Chrome, The Chrome team mostly will only take changes, as I understand it, and I've been around, from Google's own developers. And so is this an open source project? Well. Yes and no, but it certainly doesn't fit the spirit of what most of the people in the open source community are trying to do. Firefox, on the other hand, is not that. You absolutely can take Firefox's repository and the Mozilla Corporation will absolutely consider your changes if you send them up there. And if they make sense to put in the project, they absolutely will go into the project. So that's, that's a fundamental difference.
Another fundamental difference is open governance. Uh, typically, there's two models of governance for open source projects. For small projects and for some mature projects, it's common to have a so-called benevolent dictator, somebody who started the project and sort of makes all the rules. That model has been shown over the last 10 or 20 years to be a weak model for the development of important things. And even most projects with benevolent dictators try to let the community participate in not just what goes in the code, not just in making changes to the code base itself, but about how the project is run, what its values are, what its content is like. A good counterexample there would be the Linux operating system, which is absolutely a benevolent dictatorship run by Linus Torvalds. An interesting thing happened recently with the Python software in which Guido Van Rossum stepped down as benevolent dictator, feeling like that had gone on long enough, and that is now governed by a community process. We'll talk more about that hopefully at some point, but typically if I'm looking at a real open source project, it's going to have some kind of real open governance model, and certainly transparency. If, if the project is being run by a cabal with, who's hiding what they're doing, well, technically, you know, if this code's under an open source license, it's under an open source license, but I wouldn't be comfortable really calling that an open source project. So why? Why are we doing open source? Why is it important to us? Well, 20 years ago, if you went back and looked at the practices being used by proprietary organizations, let's say 30 years ago, we'll go back, look at the practices being used by proprietary organizations to develop software, which was most of the software being developed 30 years ago, there were real developer efficiency issues. And part of that was accidental. We hadn't learned everything we know now about how to do good development. Part of it was kind of fundamental because with the development being limited to what companies could hire and pay people to do, that means that you're typically developing with fewer hands than you'd like. You're typically developing with a narrower skill set than you'd like. And so things that might be easier for a broader community are less easy in that setting. I mentioned just now we've learned some things. And a lot of the things we've learned really were things that were learned by the open source community and their experiments with how to do distributed uh, asynchronous development of software on a very, very large scale. And so while revision control systems, for example, were always a thing in commercial software, we're going back a long ways, the things we've learned about revision control have been amazing. While companies always had ways for their workers to communicate while they were working, our communications channels are way more sophisticated for the most part than anything being that was being used 20 or 30 years ago in industry. Uh, coding itself has changed. This idea that we can do these incremental changes with many eyeballs reviews rather than a formal process in a lot of cases, and sort of learning how to do formal process in this kind of a setting has been something that's really been contributed and so we're getting good efficiency. And the way you can see that that's the case is that good practices from the proprietary community, good practices from the open source community have blended. And you'll almost always see competent shops using whether they're open source development projects or whether they're proprietary development projects using techniques and tools that are sort of best practice. And one of the big distinctive things about open source in current year 2020 is that, yeah, the, the sharp lines are pretty much erased. Every organization uses a lot of mixes of things. So what are some of these practices? Patch-driven incremental development, absolutely an open source thing. Rather than making major changes, we tend to take small changes, sometimes coming from a variety of sources, Start this idea of growing a project, of starting with a very small thing, maybe a hundred or a thousand lines, which by industry standards is nothing, that does something useful, 
or and growing that up is absolutely a thing. The other thing that we've seen a lot of is proprietary projects that are thrown sort of over the wall into the open source space. They tend to get digested sort of by the open source community who make small incremental changes until they have a thing that's working and maintainable and cleaner than what they started with in the proprietary world. There again, Firefox is a good example of that. That started out many decades ago as Net Netscape Navigator. And when Netscape, the company, folded up, they threw over the wall this giant pile of code for a web browser that was missing some key features because those were proprietary features they couldn't read, give away under an open source license. And the community over you know 20 or 30 years has really uh, turned that into a browser that is very much an open source project by patch-driven incremental. Very few major reasons to refactor. Another sort of practice of open source that's real common is this idea that code is cheap. If you are paying developers to produce code, it doesn't feel cheap to you as an organization. Developers are expensive, and 50 to to $100 per line of code is not a crazy number to think about when you're talking about the cost of developing code commercially, which means that even small code bases in term, by industrial scale can be very, very expensive. One of the things that having contributed development does is it allows you to say, well, we're going to try things, we're going to put code in, we're going to rip code out when we want to, and we're not going to feel bad about those things because, you know, we can always produce more code. It shifts the focus away from code as a precious resource. I mean, the code is just a language in which things are described, and that's been a really important practice um, that open source has brought to the team. Open source has always been very tool driven because the open source folks don't have the top down management structure that a lot of proprietary organizations do. They've had to figure out how to make tools substitute for process in a lot of cases. And so, as I said before, the history of source code management in recent years is the history of open source development, making it better and better. The history of programming tools, 20 or 30 years ago, if you had a compiler, there was a good chance it was a proprietary compiler that was produced by some company, sold under a proprietary license, very expensive. These days, really nobody will take your programming language seriously unless there are high quality open source implementations of it, at least one of those. And so that's a huge, huge change over 20 years that's been driven by this open source's need to be able to do that. But also programming language tools, Everything from syntax highlighters to debuggers to linkers to whatever it is you're going to need, probably they're, you're working mostly in open source these days. Our communication and collaboration tools are kind of a big deal. We have used IRC historically, although that's finally fading after however long it's been, 30 years. Um, Email and email lists have always been a thing. Again, those are fading. Forums are not fading. We have more of them than ever before. Uh, issue trackers. If you go to something like GitHub and GitLab now, what you'll see is a one-stop shop really for project development, including a whole bunch of collaboration tools. There's an issue tracker that's a very nice issue tracker on both those. There's a wiki, which is a very usable wiki for communicating that kind of stuff. There's website support so that you can host your website right there in the development space. Now, these are powerful tools, and you know I could go on and on. They're, these are powerful tools for development. And making those free and widely used has been really important to improving everybody's development efficiency. But the many proprietary projects use these. And you know, to the extent that build and configuration management is still a thing, absolutely, we've led the way in that. Auto tools, which was used for a long time by everybody to configure the C and C++ projects, it was really an open source tool. And to the extent that it's gone away in the last 10 years, it's because it's been replaced by other open source tools that are better. Again, we can't put build people on projects so we put build 
tools on projects. And one of the things that does is it sort of standardizes practice in a way that's really useful. Again, I could go on test infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, a lot of places where sort of open source processes have had. So when I say what's open source, what do I really mean? I mean, yes, absolutely code and other work distributed under a license that's OSI approved, but yes, a community that operates in the open source style, and yes, a community whose development is done using sort of open source processes and practices. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. In the next lecture, I'm going to continue from what we did last time, talking about how to choose a project. We're going to talk about how to set one up in a way that meets this definition of open. Again, I hope everyone's staying safe and well out there. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you again soon.